against life, the life of anyone, except those who conform to what the worldly power says is a winning life. It's a war against the unborn. The millions whose bodies and whose have been turned in horrible ways into perfumes, into products for research. The unborn, whose little bodies are thrown away in garbage heaps. The unborn, whose mothers, who birth, wanted to birth those bodies, who carried those bodies, have been marred and scarred. That war, that war is a particular one waged by the Knights of Columbus. Look at how God has given us a divine confirmation that this must be our struggle. What was the first miracle of Michael McGivney? It was the healing of a child in the womb of his mother, a woman who had been told, this child will never live. You must abort this child. A woman who said, turning to Saint, to pray God, I had Saint, to Michael McGivney and said, let the healing of my unborn child be the miracle. And that child is healed. Brothers, sisters, this is the divine seal for the fellowship of Michael and give me that our first struggle is not one of an idea. Our first struggle is to let the world see what it refuses to see. The young boy. It's a war against the elderly. Across the street here is what used to be Glengar, the, the convent where my dear sisters of, uh, of the Ursulines who taught me used to live. Now it's doing what Catholics do first and do best, the Christians do. We think that someone who is dying is one who has a power and a witness and should be treasured. It's now a hospice. But Catholic institutions like hospices and palliative care, because we were first to go to care for those who society thinks is just an extra mouth to feed, who doesn't fit into the bottom line, Catholic institutions are now being, here in Canada, put under great pressure to allow that which is the most fundamental violation of why we do what we do. The knowledge given to us with divine clarity in Christ Jesus that life is a gift of God and must be treasured until the end. That war has taken a bizarre turn. The war against the elderly and the useless. We are right now shutting down our culture to protect the old and the vulnerable. It will break us the way that we're going to do this. And what will happen? We will resent the ones that we are being told we must protect. And we will get our money back and our government, which by its laws are expanding already the circumstances for government assistance. No, government killing of those who do not wish to live anymore. Government assistance in suicide, we will be able to do in the retirement homes what we don't want the virus to do. This is the diabolical war that we had better wake up to. We are being manipulated by evil 
so that we say, yeah, why don't we just let the old die and keep McDonald's open? It's a war against the marginal and the different able ones. Yet we look into the mystery of all of these, the unborn, the elderly, the marginal, the disabled, and we respond, we nicely call on this. Which was the 
center of the great place of American business of insurance wouldn't have anything to do with these people because they were walking liabilities. They were written off as dispensable labor. And that's where my Gibney worked. But he didn't respond like a lot of people did. Angry anarchists who started bombing them to bring down the government. Or socialists who wanted to enforce a new kind of control. No. He did something in his battle practical. And that was insurance. That was support. To care for families. He did something godly. Because God became flesh to teach us that just as the Word became flesh, so our faith has to become practical flesh. Not out of anger. The other day, someone said the Catholic internet is blowing up over the Pope's comments about something. I said, good, let the damn internet blow up. And maybe Catholics will get off of their tush and go down to the soup kitchens. Right? Pay real attention to things. He lived in a time in which to be a Catholic in the United States was to be scum. The whole of the United States was founded, though there was one Catholic state, by people who really didn't like Catholics. The pictures that we have at the time show the bishops coming ashore looking like alligators with their minds like jaws, ready to eat up the pure, virginal Protestant America. The church that he served at, where I, where I worship, St. Mary's, the New York Times in the 1880s put a picture of it said, Catholic structure ruins most beautiful street in America. That's what it meant to be a Catholic. How did he respond? How do we respond? He responds as a knight looking to their king. Look at 1920. At the very end of Christendom, when the idea of there being, as I said earlier, of there being an ability to have Europe, at least, and maybe Europe and its colonies, united in a Christian way to transform the world, died once and for all. At that very moment, Pope Pius XI proclaimed the feast we're going to celebrate very soon. Christ the King. At the very moment when Christ the King of nations seemed to be unreal, he proclaimed the truth that is unseen, that Christ is the King. That all else is vanity of vanities. And think of all the kings that have come and gone through them since then. Think of the great powers. Their names live in infamy. Stab. Huh? Hitler. Huh? Horrible people. Marcos. Does that give me trouble in the Philippines? It better not. These are people. Men. Who set up other kingdoms. And where are they now? Today, sisters and brothers, another end of Christ the King has happened. Christ the King of families. Christ the glue that holds generations together seems to have gone. Brothers and sisters from the Philippines, we all of us, and you are, a first generation on a new land that we've never been before. It's a land where being a Christian is not even at the center. It's pushed to the side. You've come from a place that still sort of echoes with faith, with families that are tied together by that now you're planted and raising your children in a land where they're going to be co-parented. Because you're not only the parents and grandparents, there's another parent. And it's called the society all around it. And it 
as a society that has no time for Christ. This is the challenge of the war of the new generation. You've got to wake up to it. Because it isn't just yours, it's ours too. I look at grandparents who weep because their grandchildren do not know the rhythm of life. I do. My nephews and nieces that I love so much, how is this woven into their life? One, right now is in the RCI, praise God. What joy. One of the dead so far. This is our struggle. What do we do? This new attack against the church isn't vague out there. The church is the glue, is the joy. I see it rupturing at funerals. When the older ones give the responses, and the younger ones have no idea what's going on. What do we do? This is the challenge. We have to, first of all, though, be very attentive of the way in which we are being used in it. Because, especially when you're transplanted, say, from the Philippines, the tools of your success can make you tools of themselves. What do I mean? You've come to a place in which wisdom, which favors people who have actually lived and had a life, is now being replaced by clever dicks who know how to fiddle around on the computers. I go to my grandchildren, I mean grandnephews, they know more about a computer than I do. It's a backward world with the clever and the stupid, because they don't know anything about life, are the ones who are held up. Whereas the wise, who have actually been through it, who in times past were respected. We go and hear about our First Nations people and how we must respect our elders. The First Nations people tell me, the elders say, they're always talking about us, but they never listen. Join the club. Just look at who. Did you see the faces of the guys from the tech giants who are running the largest companies that the world has ever seen? Transnational companies that control in communication and information in a way that nobody has ever done before. Google and Apple. Right? It's Google and uh, Facebook and Twitter. Did you see those guys? Some of them have beards, big long ones, but they come with their rings and stuff. It's like, you're kids. You don't know anything. And you're running the world? Where is wisdom in all of this? And we lie down in front of our kids. They get the, we give them the implant. We're all saying, oh, we don't want to have government implants in our kids to track them. As soon as you buy your kid a cell phone, they're now a tool of those guys. Contact, so important in a Filipino, in an immigrant, in a human family, has now been replaced by virtual distance. Huh, what's the difference between having dinner at COVID time and before, not much, because the kids are still not attentive. <laughs> right? Our tools have become our masters. They master me. Our tools have made us their tools. And family? Family is replaced by individuals left vulnerable. Why? So that big governments who can sell their power of coercion can be used by big corporations. This is a real war. If you think that the great winner out of this COVID time is not Amazon, then you've got another thing coming. Small businesses, the Filipino bakeries, 
the bookstores, they're dead. And one big transnational is going to stand. Wow, thanks, Father. This is really uplifting. Because you still have to send money back to the Philippines, don't you? I've seen it amongst my Filipino brothers and sisters. How you come here and you want the best for your children in the land that you're in. It says that the best is financial. And you got pressure from home to help people that are living in desperation. And you dig yourself deep, 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 deep into debt. And you work three jobs. I remember when I was in Edmonton, I, the Filipinos would come and ask me to bless their cars. And I said, I'm not going to bless cars that were sold by this particular group of car dealers run by a bunch of uh, Middle Eastern types who would hire Filipinos to buy their cars, to sell their cars to their friends. And then as soon as the friends had run out, fire and get rid of them. And I said, you bring me a car from them, I'm not blessing. Right? All of this, brothers and sisters, is the tool of the evil one. It's, and it set its sight on the church. Because, Besides Amazon, besides this huge consumeristic world that gets its tools into anyone, everyone's life, there is but one force of globalization 